The emerald tome recalls the various ages over the centuries. Golden, silver, bronze, dragons, giants, and elven ages. Now, here we are in the Iron Age, which is also considered the Age of Humans. It's a cold, silent night on Erin Island, and Rhiannon prays fervently to the Morning Star. She asks for guidance and hopes that her brother will understand her decision. Tonight will be the night her destiny unfolds, and her greatest desire is the courage to see this through. On the other hand, Rhiannon's brother, first warrior Arthur, hunts boars with the men of the Gale clan. He's unaware that a military force is about to launch an attack on their small village, led by the high priest of the Divine Empire, Dork. Dork announces his arrival and threatens to execute the villagers if they don't surrender. However, silence welcomes him, so he orders his troops to set the houses on fire until the people come out. This prompts Rhiannon to come out and acknowledge his presence. The priest asks where the other villages are. She calmly explains that the men went hunting while the rest gathered mushrooms, so there's no one else. The leader refuses to believe this and swords are now pointed toward her neck. If she doesn't squeal, then they'll force the other's whereabouts out of her. Wait up! Dork realizes that she's Eren's greatest oracle priestess, a highly famed figure throughout the land. She's also the successor to the legendary kingdom of Albion and a descendant of the elf king Spuiru. It's then revealed that the divine empire needs her elven blood. Dork explains that approximately two lunar cycles ago, the priests predicted the demon king's revival and destruction of this world. However, the senators established a decree to seal his tomb. It appears the empire has other plans as they intend to use Rhiannon as a living sacrifice. They believe that their efforts for the Demon King's return will be generously rewarded with power and status. Unwilling to be a catalyst for such a horrendous act, Rhiannon clutches a dagger towards her own neck. She's willing to end it all for a greater purpose. On the other hand, things are still business as usual in the forest. Arthur's humongous hunt gains praise from his comrades. Despite the victory, his senses are telling him there's something wrong. There definitely is. Dork calls Rhiannon's self-sacrifice a bluff. The look on her face, though, says otherwise. Needing a guarantee, the soldiers maliciously pick out two village children to use as hostages. Fure and Yureva, two gale children, scream at the soldiers to let them go. Dork unsheathes his blade and expounds on how he plans to have these kids experience a slow, agonizing death. Even if Rhiannon ends herself on the spot, these kids will not be so lucky. This is enough to have her release the blade from her own hands. The kids quickly run to Rhiannon for an embrace after the soldiers let them go. They apparently return to keep her company. Left without a choice, Rhiannon pledges her obedience to Dork in exchange for the children's safety. Dork now demands to know her true name, the source of her power and strength. With a deep breath, she utters the words, this simple act turns her eyes cold and lifeless. The hunters finally return to the village. Arthur notes it's too quiet. He calls for his sister's name only to find Fure and Yureva coming out of hiding. After learning of previous events, he immediately gathers the warriors of Gale. It's their sworn duty to save the chieftain's daughter and his sister, Rhiannon. We move on to some secret underground lair. Dork and his peons prepare for the ritual. All the ingredients are gathered, from the cauldron to the living sacrifice. It's time to end the age of humankind. Now that he knows the name of the Demon King, Dork bellows it at the top of his lungs. Aron! Near the facility, Arthur and a few men prepare for an ambush. They're lacking in numbers compared to the soldiers, but the cloudy night sky favors these gale warriors. After taking out the only light source, they decimate every night from the shrouds of the shadows. Arthur's group makes commendable progress. While this happens, the rotten priest continues with the summoning. He establishes the coffin as the body, the cauldron as the world of the dead, and the sacrifice as the connection to the human realm. With a loud and boastful bellow, Dork awakens the demon king and promises to rule the world alongside him. This enchantment causes the coffin to light up, 
An enormous glowing seal rises above their heads. Just a few moments later, the heavens open up to welcome a majestic bolt of lightning that strikes right on sight. The resultant energy is so tremendous that it paints the sky blood red as tremors rattle the earth. The underground base begins caving in. Luckily, Arthur's right-hand man, Ladu, pushes him out of harm's way just as a massive rock falls. The man survives relatively unscathed but is trapped behind the rubble. He reminds Arthur of his duty to save Rhiannon as the village's first knight and begs him to survive this ordeal. Hearing that, Arthur rushes off. Finally, from the coffin emerges a shadowy giant. The Demon King has finally awakened. Aron asks the filthy mortals why they have summoned him. Doruk pridefully answers it's because they have the same desire to hasten the world's destruction. As they converse, Arthur slays multiple soldiers but is held back by sheer numbers. His desperation is obvious as even he can sense the times hastily running out. With a victorious yet villainous grin, Doruk proposes a deal to Aron, a powerful position as ruler in the Demon King's monarchy in exchange for this human sacrifice. Rhiannon's blood, flesh, and soul are now his to devour. Arthur witnesses the shadowy figure slowly turning into a shape of a handsome, gray-haired man. He desperately tries to get to his sister before the man does. Doruk evilly laughs in victory as Arun carefully descends the stairs. The man's fierce eyes gaze directly into Rhiannon's, devoid of life. At this rate, it might be too late for Arthur to save his beloved sister. Despite the hopeless situation, Arthur bravely interrupts and introduces himself. Rhiannon is indispensable to their clan. As the chieftain's daughter, the next chief will be whomever she marries. Disposing of her would lead their bloodline to extinction. Arthur swears on his entire clan that anyone who dares to do so will experience his wrath. Thinking nothing of the boy, Doruk only mocks his threats. The priest also arrogantly boasts that hurting him would mean killing Rhiannon as well since he knows her true name. Suddenly, the emotionless Rhiannon quietly submits herself to Arun. She claims to be his purest servant who will love and support him for all eternity. Her words worry her brother, but he's too busy with Doruk. Arun looks into her soul and finds her trapped by petals. He commands her to open her eyes but she can't follow an unfamiliar voice. Where are his manners? Aron introduces himself and claims he's in front of her. However, Rhiannon revealing her true name turned her blind and powerless. With this, the Demon King offers his eyes and ears. The girl witnesses the happenings outside. Her brother still fighting tooth and nail to save her. However, she's given up on life and has accepted her fate. As someone who's become a failure of the tribe, she tells Arun to advise her brother to run away as she no longer has any innate worth. Ouch. This is when Rhiannon hears a ripple of blood. Oh right, she's connected to Arun right now. She can sense the intense rage and sadness in his heart. But why would the demon king spare tears of blood for a low life like her? Her heartbeat slowly rises and rises a warm fire glowing inside. Slowly, the petals release her and she regains consciousness. The demon monarch commends her efforts. Seeing this, Doruk bossily orders Arun to devour the sacrifice, but he's immediately silenced by a brutal impalement to the heart by none other than the demon king. Arun's tired of all the tragedy. This is far from true evil. In fact, he even calls the old man a selfish, cowering buffoon. Take that, Baldi. Doruk meets his end as he tumbles down the stairs. All his subordinates run for their lives. Rhiannon instantly runs to her brother, wrapping him in her warm embrace. She also excitedly tells him about Arun. Arthur still doesn't trust the newly risen king despite his good graces. The warrior aggressively points his sword at him, but as his sister says, is it worth fighting her savior? Still, Arthur insists he's a calamity that's destined to destroy this world. Despite Rhiannon's attempts to halt her brother, he pushes her away and charges at Aron ruthlessly. The boy speedily launches strikes, but Aron evades these smoothly. 
Arthur's definitely an impressive swordsman, but the gap in their abilities is too massive. Before anything tragic can occur, Rhiannon protects the Demon King by standing in his way. Good thinking, girl. Your brother would have gotten turned into a kebab. Wanting this all to stop, Rhiannon puts her scarf around Aron's neck. It's apparently the chief's garment. Additionally, she'll be his bride. Yo, is this a proposal? At least take Aron to dinner first. Now it's treason to raise a sword against Aron. Is Arthur a traitor? I didn't think so. The two siblings yap and argue over why this handsome king is more important than her dear sibling. Aron definitely has his own things to say, but save the family issues for later. An army of skeletons is coming in. The Revival Cauldron also brought all the corpses back to life. Left without a choice, Arthur now has to fight alongside Aron to escape. He still swears to brawl with him after slaying all the undead though. Together, they skillfully slash each skeleton with their blades and run to find an exit. But there's rubble in the way, and a cloaked man appears out of nowhere. The man shows his face and Arthur quickly recognizes him. He's Ogam, a sage who respectfully greets both him and Arun. Rhiannon got snubbed. Anyway, he seems to know the way out. It's just one passageway to the exit, but hundreds of skeleton soldiers block their path. The three combatants prepare to engage. Without hesitation, Arthur runs in to send some bones back to the grave. Strangely, Aron comments that Arthur's straightforward as expected. Familiar much? Rhiannon then reminds her brother to protect their new chief. He's her destined partner. The boy cringes. What on earth happened to his sister? On the other hand, Aron finds Arthur amusing. But freeing themselves from this situation should take priority for now. Arthur and Aron find themselves back to back in their attack against the corpses. They have much to discuss after all this is over. Shockingly, the seemingly omnipotent Aron bleeds from a small wound. Ogam explains the Demon King was awoken too early so his body is similar to a human's. Aron's not happy about this vulnerability, like men refusing to see a therapist. Kidding. Arthur retorts that he should return to his coffin. The siblings and the Demon King get into another argument. Ogam, as the voice of reason, restates their true objective and pushes them through a clearing. We all need Ogams in our lives. Several thick vines cover the exit door, kinda like Narnia. Arthur forcefully makes his way through them. Soon after, the group reunites with Ladu and the Gale Warriors. They commend Arthur's heroic act of saving the chieftain's daughter. Rhiannon also apologizes and thanks them for their care and protection. Just as they begin to celebrate, Ogam informs them that war might ensue if word reaches the Empire. Aron asks the million dollar question, what do you intend to do now? Finally stealing his resolve, Arthur gathers his people to stir their hearts. It's time to uphold their oath as people of the Covenant. The Gale Warriors scream their battle cry while raising their weapons and torches. Meanwhile, in the Empire, a messenger named Decimus informs Sir Gaius of the Gale clan's revolution. The knight tells him about Doruk's actions and his kidnapping of the chieftain's daughter as a sacrifice to revive the Demon King. The superior is, at first, skeptical of a Demon King actually coming to life. However, the reports of a terrifying unidentified individual on the scene cannot be ignored. So, yes, it was an idiotic move for the high priest to anger the clan. But they need to be taught a lesson as an example to everyone out there. Defiance of the Empire leads to certain death. Before the man goes on a rant over how troubling this insignificant scuffle has become, his subordinate reminds him that the walls have ears here. Not that guys cares. Anyway, they prepare to set sail for Eren. Arthur hypes his people up as they prepare to depart for Albion, where land and livestock are abundant. As they watch from afar, Aron inquires if it was Ogim's idea to take them to Albion, but the old man just laughs it off and changes the topic. The man walks off leaving Aron deep in his thoughts. That's until an arrow comes flying right at him. The demon king easily catches it in midair and glances toward its source. Suddenly, a green-haired girl runs out of the forest and aggressively attacks him with a dagger. She demands a duel on the spot. This guy got a lot of enemies. Nonetheless, he smoothly evades all her attacks and asks for her identity. 
She's not a fan of small talk. With full intent to fight, she rushes at him again but is easily countered when he slaps her weapon away. Recognizing her defeat, she begs him to kill her. Aaron sees this all as nonsense. This is when Arthur and Rhiannon happen to walk by, with the former recognizing the girl as Morgan. Back to the tent, Morgan reports that the Empire has stolen all their ships, which she was assigned to take care of. Arthur is disappointed by her incompetence and mulls over a suitable punishment. Aaron butts in and asks how the First Knight plans to resolve the issue. Since he's the one who ordered Morgan to prepare the ships, he takes full responsibility for her failure. He prostrates himself before the chief and offers his head. Morgan pleads to take his place since it was her wrongdoing. However, Aaron cringes at how these numbskulls think. Nothing will be resolved if he simply executes them. The ships won't return. Instead, their punishment is to resolve the issue. But Arthur explains that they need to set an example for the clan. In that case, since Aaron defeated Morgan in a duel earlier, he will keep her for himself. The consequence surprisingly delights the girl. She leaps for joy and promises to serve Aaron forever, even becoming his second wife. Two weird things to note. Rhiannon is happy about this, and Aaron doesn't want a harem but is getting one anyway. What luck! The following day, the operation begins. Aaron instructs his men to steal back the ships while he opens the sea gate for them to escape. Rhiannon and Morgan insist they come with him so he accepts. Meanwhile, Ogum is redelegated to freeing the ships. Despite the old man's guilt tripping, he accepts his task and reminds Aaron to take care of his fragile human body. A hailstorm of arrows from the sky stuns the Empire soldiers. Before they can react, the warriors of Gale ambush them with their blades while Ogum hits them with his staff. Morgan snipes the knight on top of the guardhouse while Aaron and Arthur slay the remaining guards. The green-haired assassin claims a vantage point that allows her to accurately deal damage from long range. It's an intense fight. No matter how many enemies arrive, the four manage to eliminate them immediately. A knight attempts to assassinate Morgan from above but is quickly decimated by Rhiannon's magic. Without opponents left in sight, the four open the sea gate. Mission complete. It's time to return to the ships. Unexpectedly, Gaius begins clapping at what he's just witnessed. He still sees Arthur as the child from the tribal conference two years ago, which angers the boy. However, Gaius's business today is with Aaron. They demand to know each other's names. With a boastful grin, Guy starts and proudly declares himself as the commander of the almighty Imperial Albion Expedition Unit. In that case, Aaron announces himself as the accidental Gale Chifton. Emphasis on accident. Gaius mocks their ridiculousness, but Aaron is serious about battling him alone. He insists the three leave despite their refusal to. As he's the Chifton, his orders are absolute. After Aaron's comrades leaves, Gaius asks if he's really the Demon King. Aaron smirks and comments that his identity is whatever they believe it is. Fed up with the small talk, Gaius throws a bejeweled dagger at him, but Aaron easily counters it and sends the weapon flying back. Gaius senses that playtime is over. He asks what Aaron's after. Regius. Aaron simply answers. The star of the king that shines in the heavens? Gaius assumes he's after the throne. But Aaron corrects him, saying he wants the principles of royalty. Distracted by his cryptic answer, Gaius fails to notice the ship sailing toward the exit. Aaron escapes and lets Gaius know that he will only understand the meaning if he passes away. Gaius doesn't bother chasing them. With his weapon now emitting a dark aura, he's confirmed one thing. Aaron's the real deal, Demon King. This show is just one plot twist after another. Now that they have the vastness of the sea to traverse, it's sure that many secrets will be uncovered about themselves and the world around them. This adventure is just getting started. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.